Okay, so for today's kind of seminar, we're extremely happy to have Tomasz Brozen joining us from the University of Ljubljana. Um, Tomasz has done seminal work in the context of transport and uh, dynamics of uh, both quantum and classical systems, integrable or, or, or chaotic. Um, and today he's going to be telling us about exactly solved models of many body quantum chaos. Thank you, Luca. So uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, seminar series. It's a pleasure for me to, to speak here. Um, so as you announced, I mean, I will speak about exactly solved models of many body chaos. Uh, so uh, it's a, basically a thread of work which have been we have started a few years ago together with these two heroes here, um, Bruno Bertini, who was a postdoc in our group for the past three years, and uh, Pavel Kos, who is a grad student uh, in the last year now. And um, my uh, plan for today is basically to, I mean, that's kind of the motivating uh, questions. I don't know, I mean, for those of you who, who have some background in dynamical systems, you have maybe heard of Baker maps or cat maps or, you know, the simple models of chaos theory on which you can basically teach your chaos theory course in the class. For example, I mean, this, in these simple models, you can um, compute simple dynamical, dynamical properties like the chaos correlation functions, for example, or chaos measures like Lyapunov exponents. Uh, well, on the other hand, of course, you cannot do that for typical dynamical systems. Now, if you look at a uh, situation in many body dynamical systems, situation so far has been that basically you had, cannot do anything except for, I mean, really trivial models, which are not chaotic, like free models or integral systems. So the question is, I mean, is there, um, is there uh, a toy model uh, which, of, of, of many body chaos, which would be kind of amenable to analytical treatment? Uh, so this was kind of the question, the, the driving question behind the studies and uh, my, my goal today is kind of to give, to give you some examples of models which can be understood as, as, as exactly solved models of many body chaos. So in a way that I would, uh, colloquially speaking, I would say these are like cat maps of many body chaos I mean, <clears throat> or many body quantum chaos, if you want. <clears throat> so, I mean, uh, they, I try to convey basically two kind of nice results, uh, which are sort of explicit enough, but, I mean, the explicit in the sense that basically we can prove things or construct things explicitly. The first result is uh, from PRA of two years ago, uh, where we show that uh, for a particular quantum spin chain, uh, which has some nice properties, we can compute uh, dynamical, uh, we can compute spectral statistics. That is, uh, we can show that spectral statistics in the form of two-point spectral correlation function or spectral, uh, uh, spectral form factor uh, are exactly matching those of random matrix, uh, random matrix theory. That, that, that's basically one of the definitions of quantum chaos. So we can basically show that model is chaotic in that sense. And uh, then uh, f uh, f in the following year in the PRL of 2019, we have tried to kind of uh, uh, generalize this concept to, 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 to uh, define the, co the, 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 the concept of the so-called dual unitary models for which we can basically compute that stuff and much more uh, for the quantum circuits, the class of quantum circuits, which we call dual unitary. For example, we can compute uh, essentially arbitrary space-time correlation functions and classify ergodic behaviors of that models according to some sort of standard ergodic hierarchy, as, as I will try to explain during my talk. So the third part, which has, is probably beyond the scope of this lecture uh, because of time, but also I mean, because of complexity, I guess, uh, but still I would like to emphasize it at this point and maybe I'll try to uh, spend a few words on that in my conclusions. Uh, uh, so, I mean, immediately, I mean, why should one be excited or one, why one can be excited about this type of studies, even though they are about very much fine tuned problems is that this, 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 these problems might be unlike free or uh, uh, integrable theories, which are very sensitive to fine tuning. I mean, as soon as you perturb some parameters, you, uh, your physics becomes completely different. These models might be structurally stable as, as, as mathematicians say. So, I mean, they might be stable against shaking uh, uh, the parameters of the model. They might still be in the same universality class or in the same dynamical complexity class if you want. So. I mean, this is known in, in, in models like cat maps, for example, like if you perturb cat maps, they are still, uh, 
dynamics has still the same topology. So, I mean, here our intuition is that maybe these models, again, are structurally stable. So, I mean, that's maybe just, you know, a kind of, I stress it immediately so that, you know, if you think that this is very much fine-tuned things, I mean, maybe it's not, maybe it's just a representative of a large universality class of chaotic dynamics. So, I mean, uh, and please, of course, interrupt me at any point if there is a, uh, uh, there is a question or there is anything that you want to clarify during the presentation. Okay, so uh, my talk is essentially about flow case systems, about periodically driven systems. Uh, even though I would like to say here, uh, I mean, I would like to make a disclaimer right away that this is not, I mean, this is not limiting generality of the discussion because you can always treat flow case systems as a characterization of continuous time systems. Or, I mean, in, you know, you can always think of it as a kind of stroboscopic map or Poincaré map of some generic dynamics. So, uh, so I mean, uh, to my taste, is flow case systems are kind of more natural even than continuous time systems. I mean, they are simpler in the sense they have no conserved quantities in general. I mean, uh, continuous time systems with continuous with time independent Hamiltonians so they have at least energy conservation, but flow case systems in general, when they are not integrable, when they are chaotic, they should have no conserved quantities. So let's assume that we have a, a flow case system, which is given in terms of periodically time dependent Hamiltonian, H of t. And uh, then what people usually do is they consider uh, not energy spectrum because that doesn't exist, but they consider a spectrum of the time evolution operator, which is a time order product of the, of the uh, so, uh, one over the one period of the drive. Uh, so the, what I call U, this is the so-called Floquet operator and its spectrum is, uh, since this is a unitary operator, its spectrum lies on a unit circle. So we can write uh, phases uh, phi, or phi n, so the, the logarithms of the eigenvalues as phases. And these phases are elements on a circle, they are points on a circle, which are from zero to two pi, right? So now what you can do is basically you can analyze this uh, uh, spectrum. I mean, the idea now is to characterize spectral statistics uh, in terms of notions of statistical mechanics, and then to compute this or compare it to, 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 to spectral statistics that you get from dynamical systems, hopefully, again, by, the, by analytical means. So let's consider now a spectrum of a flow case system as a gas in one dimension, which is confined to a circle, which is given in terms of spectral density, rho phi. And let's define now the simplest correlation, two point correlation uh, measure of this, of this spectrum, which I will note as R of theta. Now, Theta is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a cyclic variable. And uh, I assume now that uh, basically the density on average is equal to one, so that, that, that spectrum is democratic. This is an assumption, but I think it's a very reasonable assumption. So I define uh, a, a spectral uh, a, a correlation, which is average over a unit circle with an integral over phi, and theta is now a, a, a displacement coordinate. And I define it in a way such that it is a connected correlation function. So I subtract one, which is just the spectral density squared. And then what people do is they define a spectral, spectral uh, Fourier transform of this two-point function, which they call spectral form factor, SFF. Uh, I will use units in which I normalize it in a way that I multiply it with this factor here, such that if you do this two-line calculation, so this is just a standard Fourier transform, but imagine now the function that in Fourier transform is, uh, uh, is, a, is a function of a circle. So the natural Fourier variable is an integer, right? So the time, which is dual now to this quasi-energy is a Fourier variable. Uh, is an integer, right? So, I mean, which actually means the number of repetitions of your, flow, of your number of iterations of your flow rate, right? <clears throat> of your time, if you want, discrete time, number of flow rate periods. So, I mean, if you really now uh, expand this integral, uh, I mean, uh, work it out, then you find that it's basically, basically it's just a double sum over the spectrum of uh, e to the i t times phi n over phi m. So the distances between two arbitrary pair of quasi energies which in turn is just the trace of the u of u to the t uh, modulus square. So it's a very nice and very simple uh, uh, expression of the spectrum, spectral uh, Fourier transform of a two point function in terms of the traces of the dynamical propagator over time, at time t modulus square. So it's a kind of, if you want, uh, average Loschmidt echo or lo uh, average return probability. I mean, if you think of representing a trace as expectation value of going from a random state, coming back to the same random state and averaging over random states, that's exactly the average over, let's say, how, how random average um, random states. 
Then we, and then there is this uh, trivial factor, I mean, trivial uh, delta function at equal to zero, which we subtract just in order to make these things, I mean, well behave at t equals zero. Otherwise we have this <coughs> singularity, which is right. <clears throat> okay, so now the problem now here, I mean, the, 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 the the disclaimer we have to make immediately here is that this quantity is, is by itself is not very 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 stable at least if you compute it for individual dynamical systems it doesn't really make sense I will, as, I, as i will demonstrate later with some numerical experiment so spectral form factor as people say is not a self-averaging quantity i mean it doesn't make sense if you unless you average it over something over something right so what people usually write is they define a, an ensemble average spectral form factor where E means now an averaging over an ensemble of systems, may either just you know playing with some parameter uh, on which system depends, just averaging over a small range of parameters, or if you are in a random matrix theory, you can average over the whole in, in ensemble of random matrices, or you can even average like you can even do moving averages over time. So it doesn't really, I mean, you can actually define these things for individual dynamics, but you have to average over sufficiently uh, wide uh, uh, windows of time such that, you know, things start to converge. I mean, that all depends how you make the limits, uh, thermodynamic limit, time to, infinite, time to infinite limit and stuff that we'll discuss later. But the point is, I mean, unless you average these things, it's not well defined, so you have to average. Okay, so now let's see what random matrix the theory give, uh, tells us about this spectral form factor. So, um, uh, so for, 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 for dynamics for which the evolution operator is given in terms of uh, up, random matrices without additional structure, except for existence or non-existence of time reversal. These are the so-called circular or Dyson's ensembles of unitary matrices. So I mean, if there is no time reversal, this is the so-called circular unitary ensemble. If there is a time reversal, then these matrices are uh, belonging to circular orthogonal ensemble, which are, in plain words, just uh, symmetric, symmetrized unitary matrices. And uh, if, we, if you average over these symmetric spaces, which are, I mean, in the first case, there are, is uh, unitary, COU is a group, but COU is not a group, but it's an appropriate space which are, with appropriate half measure. So if you average over those spaces, then you find uh, these results, which are, uh, uh, I mean, which, which can be computed analytically. Uh, uh, so for, 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 for assistance without time reversal symmetry, then spectral form factor behaves for short times just proportional to time. For times which are less than the number of uh, uh, curly n, curly n is the dimension of the Hilbert space, which is basically the number of quasi energy levels. So after that, uh, there is a saturation, namely the, I, mean, I will not even discuss analytical results after that, but you know, I just give you a picture. Um, so for the unitary matrices, you have this linear ramp of spectral form factor until, until it hits the saturation plateau, and then it just saturates to the saturation. And this time at which it saturates, then we, this time is again associated to the number of uh, the dimension of the, of the matrix, the dimension of the Hilbert space uh, is the so-called Heisenberg time, or if you want, it is just the inverse of the level density uh, of the level space. So it's uh, inverse of the level spacing. So it's proportional to the level density if you want. <clears throat> So, I mean, uh, so this is the first and essentially the only in our story, I mean, for the main time scale, right? I mean, this time scale is given by the finiteness of the Hilbert space. And this gives us the, the, the time at, at which the, 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 the ramp, the linear increase of spectral form factor has to stop. <clears throat> now, if you have a time reversal symmetry, then the spectral form factor basically increases with a tw twice the slope, which is 2t. Um, and if you don't have, I mean, on the other hand, if, if, if your uh, spectrum is Poissonian, as people say, so if there is no correlations among eigenvalues, which according to the famous Barry Tabor conjecture would, should apply to integrable systems. So if you have an integrable system, people believe that spectrum is, uh, since spectrum can be computed by, by some explicit formula or uh, beta ansatz or, or something like that. I mean, uh, there is an argument, uh, which I'm not going to into, but this argument kind of explains in, at least intuitively why there should be no correlations among levels, which means levels can be treated as random Poisson events on the energy line, which means that spectral form factor should be just flat. That means that there should be no ramp. But that means that, you know, if you compare these spectral form factors for different class of dynamics, you find huge differences, at least at short times. There is this huge correlation hole 
at very short times, um, expected at least for flow case systems. I mean, this is all for flow case systems. I'm not discussing any decay of spectral form factor. I mean, this decay is all in this delta function, which I subtracted. So, I mean, we can discuss later, I mean, what happens in continuous time dynamics, but you know, <laughs> flow case is nice also because I don't have to worry about decay. I only worry about the ramp. And uh, okay, and still, you know, if you have a random matrix, the only three results are simple, but if you have dynamical systems, then necessarily there has to be a time before which random matrix theory cannot yet apply because there has to be kind of dynamics has to be, you know, model dependent. I mean, it should depend on the particular model that you have in mind. So there is a time scale, which people nowadays usually call a tauless time, uh, even though it's not, you know, there are different notions of tauless time and this tauless time really doesn't depend on, I mean, depends only on the spectrum. So it's a very abstract notion of tauless time, but still, I mean, there is a natural time scale, you know, which discriminates between, you know, I mean, at least, or which sets in uh, a time after which random matrix results can 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 apply. Okay, so now that remember just these two time scales. Yes. So how, how do you think about the Thales time when I don't have any conserved quantities? Because often my intuition is sort of that you know. Right. I've had some conserved quantities that have diffused sort of hydrodynamically over the entire system. Right, right. and that's that's a natural definition of Thales time. And here we have no conserved quantities, so uh, uh, you you can't really use that intuition. So I mean, usually, as you will see, uh, this Thales time is much shorter than time Thales time when you have conserved quantities, and when it is there is a diffusion, which is a natural phenomenon, uh, uh, which is associated to chaos. So then Thales time should grow at least as fast, or it will grow universally as L squared. As, uh, as uh, the mesh of the system, well, number of qubits, if you want, number of spins, number of uh, yeah, uh, linear size of the system square. Now here, as you will see, Thales time will basically not grow with L at all, or in some cases, it will proportional to log L. So it's much shorter. Uh, uh, due to absence of conserved quantities, Thales time typically is much shorter. That's the, the general, general uh, conclusion I can say immediately, but, but we can discuss this later. Great, thank you. Okay, so, right, so now uh, that's what random matrix theory teaches us. Now let's see what some history of quantum chaos uh, would uh, uh, predict for the behavior of spectral form factor. I mean, there is actually a long history of quantum chaos problems of single particles. So, I mean, single particle quantum chaos or single particle dynamical systems. Namely, there is a uh, uh, um, uh, a set of results uh, from 1980s, which culminated in the so-called Bohigas Janone Schmidt conjecture, saying that spectral fluctuations of quantum systems which are chaotic and ergodic in classical limits should be universal and describe the random matrix theory. So that's that's the abstract definition of quantum chaos. And now, I mean, I will not go into uh, any discussion of quantum Lyapunov of exponents and orthogs and all that. But this is kind of complementary approach to chaos, and it's maybe more abstract because it doesn't require any semi-classical. Well, in this case, it requires classical limit because we have to define what we mean by chaotic. But I will try to be even more abstract later. I mean, maybe just uh, avoiding classical notions uh, at all. But now, uh, this has been uh, at least the way it's written. I mean, it has been a conjecture which has stimulated a lot of uh, uh, activity in the 1980s and 1990s. These are just two typical cases of models which are classically chaotic. Uh, the study on billiard or regular, the circular billiard, for which one finds spectral statistics, which are, I mean, here I show not the spectral form factor, but uh, for let's say computational or experimental purposes, much more convenient uh, level spacing distribution. Just uh, the histogram of level spacings, which again for Poisson is just exponential. For a random matrix is the so-called Lignard Dyson distribution, and then. We see here nice agreements with the results from numerical diagonalization of this uh, Laplacians on this on these billiards. Now, uh, this has been a big question, as I say, in, 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 in the history of quantum chaos, and also the progress on this question has been basically one of the main threats of, of uh, results of quantum chaos. So I'll try to just use one slide to go through that. And again, here, uh, people who try to really answer this question theoretically mathematically, they address not spectral, uh, not uh, histogram of level spacings, but rather spectral form factor because mathematically it's much easier to treat. I mean, it's a two-point function. It's a pure two-point function. So now again, a question is uh, <clears throat> how to show that for chaotic, strongly chaotic, mathematically speaking, hyperbolic systems, spectral form factor should 
agree with random matrices, in particular to all orders uh, when expanded in, in time. So the all orders in T to the N. And uh, that has been a why, why, why the, I mean, there is, it's a natural thing to, to think of expanding spectral form factor in orders of tau, because now different orders correspond to different orders in H bar. I mean, so the, basically there are different semi-classical uh, uh, approximate, I mean, different approximations, different subsequent approximations in ex semi-classical expansions. So to the first order, leading order in H bar and leading order in tau, uh, this is the so-called diagonal approximation of Barry, <clears throat> which is an old result from 1985, basically, basically posed the problem. So again, I've, if you may remember, I mean, uh, spectral form factor was defined essentially as trace of u to the t square. So now you can think of expanding this uh, in terms of Feynman path integral and using methods of stationary phase to expand the path integral. So trace of u to the t basically can be written then as a sum of our stationary points. Stationary points are actually periodic orbits because it's a trace. So it's a periodic orbit in phase space. So periodic orbits have actions S of p and amplitudes A of p. And so basically, since there is a double sum, uh, there is a trace, this has to result in a double sum. And this double sum then can ter have terms which are wildly oscillating, right? And uh, the question is, under what conditions this term kind of constructively interfere? And uh, the simpler, are, uh, the simpler uh, proposition here is that, of course, one has to use random phase approximation, which basically says that this, uh, these terms will be constructively interfere only when the two actions will be the same. Otherwise, there will be destructive interference of the terms will on average cancel out, which means that only when sp is equal to sp prime, this, this, this term should contribute, which means that this double sum results in a single sum of contributions, which are just modulus uh, of the square of the, of the amplitudes. And now there is a factor of two, which is resulting from time reversal symmetry, namely only when there is a time reversal, then the orbits come in pairs. So each orbit should be paired not only, not only by itself, but also by, by its time reversed partner. So there is a factor of two. <clears throat> so at, at the end, you get this uh, leading result, which is t tau or to tau, right? <clears throat> tau being an integer. Uh, okay, the last equality sign is simply a result of classical ergodicity. It's the so-called Hanai Osorio de Almeida sum rule. I mean, it's, but it's just an expression of classical ergodicity, which is, can be worked out <clears throat> by some yeah, classical analysis. Okay, the question is, I mean, how to move on? And uh, it's been like uh, almost two decades or uh, 16 years between Barry's uh, leading order approximation and the second order uh, second order term. And second order term has been, uh, has been uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, considered a breakthrough. I mean, namely there's a paper by Zibor and Richter who proposed uh, self-encountering pairs of orbits, then the orbits which uh, meet them their cell, themselves in, in, in configuration space, like this one, number eight. These orbits can be actually considered not as, as, as single orbits, but as quadruplets of orbits or doubles of doubles of orbits. Namely, each double is has its time reverse partner. But then, uh, then there could, could be two ways in which this self-avoided crossing of an orbit can be can be understood, right? I mean, what you can traverse number eight in two ways. So which means that uh, there is a simple combinatorial factor one gets and this factor, I mean, uh, which, uh, I mean, and of course there is also a way to understand now there is an extra interference in this double sum, which comes from these number eight orbits and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's just like a history of the problem, but uh, uh, this then culminated in a PhD thesis of Sebastian Miller in 2004 uh, uh, in the group of uh, Fritz Hacke, who basically worked out these combinatorics to all orders and show that at each order, uh, the result exactly matches the result that one gets from uh, path integral or stationary, sound, stationary phase approximation and so on of this double, double, double sum, that it is exactly matches the random matrix prediction. <clears throat> so this was a considered like a big success uh, and it was a big success. I mean, it, it kind of is, uh, answered many, many, many doubts which people had. Maybe one of the doubts was that semi-classics would never be able to explain uh, a random matrices, mat random, random matrix results uh, on spectral fluctuations. And that has been kind of <clears throat> shown by this, uh, by mid 2000s. <clears throat> okay, but now the big question, which I'd like to continue on here is what happens? I mean, now all this, I mean, this semi-classics, which was very nice method uh, uh, uses a small parameter, which is effective Planck constant. I mean, Planck constant, of course, is a dimensional parameter, but you know, 
basically what you have to assume is that the ratio of typical actions uh, and uh, physical age bar, which is an, an effective Planck constant, that has to be a small number or vice versa. I mean, age bar over typical action has to be a small number, meaning that you can do asymptotics. You can do uh, stationary phase uh, in Feynman half integral, so you can do asymptotics. I mean, the question is what can you do if an H bar, effective H bar is of order one when, and you have a many body system. So of course, if you have a few body system and H bar is of order one, then you have just few levels and then you are trivial. But the question is what happens when you have an extended system uh, like uh, many bosons, many fermions, but H bar effectively being uh, large. <clears throat> for fermions, it's naturally large or spins one half, for example, uh, like uh, yeah, spin chains and so on, I mean, which we'll discuss later. Now the question is, I mean, what can you do in so those systems? And of course, people are using uh, a random matrix spectral statistics as a working definition of chaos for almost decades now. Uh, for example, this is from a review paper by Marco Sligol and Lea Santos uh, uh, on an exemplar model, which is just spin chain or fermionic chain with nearest neighbor and next to nearest neighbor hoppings and nearest neighbor and next to nearest neighbor interactions. And when you switch on the nearest, next to nearest neighbor terms, I mean, when there, there are uh, when they are zero, then the model is integrable. But then when you switch on the primed uh, coupling variables, then the model becomes non-integrable. And then you have a transition. This is just a spacing distribution of transition from Poisson to wigner dyson So now uh, the question is, I mean, why should, you know, now you have this, I mean, okay, this is a Hamiltonian system, but still, I mean, you have a many body system with two to the L dimensional Hilbert space, right? This is L spins. I mean, okay, it's particle conservation, but still, I mean, the dimensionality of effective Hilbert space or the block of Hilbert space you have to consider is, is exponentially large in L. But there is, first of all, I mean, the, the Hamiltonian matrix is hugely sparse. I mean, each matrix element, each, each state is only connected to other uh, L states, which is logarithmic in Hilbert space dimension. And not only that, these connections, these, con these, these amplitudes in Hamiltonian matrix are very systematic numbers. They are just one of four values, j, j prime, v, and v prime. So they are, I mean, they're highly non-random, right? I mean, there is no way to, 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 to consider this as a random matrix. So the question is, how can one use random matrix uh, theory to, to describe statistics of such uh, of spectrum of such a, such a systematic non-random non, non deterministic Hamiltonians? So this is a big question, I think. I mean, it was a I mean, puzzling question, at least to me, it was a puzzling question for over two decades. And I've seen no reason why this should be true, even though there was huge evidence accumulating. Uh, right, so now the question, I mean, the point of my talk is basically to show that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, we have models for which we can show these connections. Okay, now let's go back to Floque systems. I mean, this was just a short excursion into Hamiltonian systems. For Floque systems, I will now just show some numerics on spectral form factor in kick teasing chain, which is the model that I'm going to discuss later. Um, this is just to show that uh, uh, what happens if you just compute a spectrum and don't do any self any, any averaging, just to, just to show what does it mean that model is not self averaging. I mean, these sent sent uh, 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 points, right? This 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 is black points all over the place. These are the results of the spectral form factor uh, over time for this kick spin chain. Uh, so it doesn't make any sense. But if you just move, do a moving time average over, I think, ten or hundred subsequent. Uh, uh, subsequent uh, points in time. So there's a moving time average, then you get this black curve, which nicely overlaps with the red curve, which is just, just a random matrix result. I mean, this is for a system of, I think, 18 spins. So the Hilbert space is large enough so that basically just moving time average smoothens out, smoothen, smoothens out the, the, the data and you get nice agreement with random matrices. And it's just, just to claim that it's not necessary to do in sample averaging if you have enough data. <clears throat> okay, and then, I think just a few years ago, I mean, finally we have arrived to first kind of results which uh, point out to physical mechanism how random matrix results can build in, can, 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 build, uh, can be derived from, let's say, dynamical, uh, dynamical models of <coughs> many body, many body spins or many body, <coughs> many body quantum systems. I mean, there was two kind of sets of papers, let's say, or two papers. Uh, I mean, there was a paper from our group. Uh, I will not discuss it in this talk because I want to discuss something else, which is, I would say, a bit more explicit and mathematically more, 
uh, rigorous, but the, the, you know, this is sort of more general uh, uh, connection, which we have done in 2018, uh, pointing out that there is a kind of random a periodic orbit theory, which allows us to compute spectral form factor in a way which is similar to Barry and Zimmer and Richter and company uh, program, uh, which is possible, which is feasible also for spin one half systems. The price to pay there was that one has to require some sort of long range interactions, otherwise some sort of random phase arguments, which are necessarily needed in this kind of hand wavy derivations would not work. And then there was a, a, a series of papers from Oxford group of John Choker, who treated uh, many body systems again, uh, quasi 1D. So uh, in the form of local quantum circuits, brickwork quantum circuits, but uh, the price they had to pay was that they had to consider local Hilbert space dimension uh, to be large, should they call it Q, uh, which again is not very satisfactory in this sense, because again, local Hilbert space dimension can be considered as one of the effective H bars. So again, they had to have a small parameter or a large parameter for the analysis. Uh, okay, so now we don't want to enter into those studies. I just mentioned it, but uh, now the question is, I mean, what can we do for models where, when there is no small parameter and there are local interactions? And as I said, I mean, in the first study, we had to assume there was a, a bit of long rangeness in the interaction, but now the question is, what can we do with the interactions are strictly local? I mean, can we do anything? And uh, we have to, of course, <clears throat> find a special point in uh, a set of models for which we can do something and uh, try to convince you that this is indeed uh, possible. So uh, let's now precisely define this uh, kick teasing model. I mean, we treat now for the first, for the next 10 minutes, maybe we treat this class of models. So uh, these are the spin chains, which are basically like classical easing models, which are perturbed or kicked by a transverse field. And they are kicked or they're driven uh, in terms of periodic delta uh, kicking. Uh, so that the Floki operator, the time order product is simply a composition of two exponentials, two, two, uh, uh, two propagators. One is uh, generated in terms of the freezing and the other is the kick. So it's a really a very simple model. I mean, you can think of really as kind of minimal model. I mean, uh, interaction is two body, but the interacting terms are mutually commuting. And then there is a single, single kind of single body uh, integrability breaking, if you want. Now, namely the model, I mean, the model now has basically three parameters, two fundamental parameters. One is the spin coupling, J, the easing coupling. The other is the transverse field, which I will call B. And then there is the longitudinal field, which I will call H sub J. And I will allow for technical reasons that the longitudinal field will be depending on the position. So longitudinal field is uh, still, I mean, I will introduce some sort of disorder, which will be weak. I will switch it off at the end, but it's a technical tool, which is necessary to to, to do, let's say, mathematical, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, I mean, to prove something about this model. So it's, one has to introduce fictitious disorder, which is then switched off at the end, or you can leave it the disorder. You can discuss disordered models. If you want, you can discuss Floki MBL, depending on what you are, want to do with this. <clears throat> okay, so now, uh, right. So there are these two uh, key parameters, J and B, uh, uh, which are static, uh, which, which are, homogeneous, and then there is position depending, position dependent longitudinal field. And the kick teasing model is integrable if either of the two uh, fields are vanishing, namely if the, the, the launch, if the transverse field uh, uh, vanishes, then this is just a classical easing model. It's just diagonal if you want. But if the longitudinal fields are vanishing, uh, then the model is uh, equivalent to free fermions. I mean, you can use Wigner Jordan transformation and map it to free fermions. So again, uh, it, it's exactly solvable, it's integral. But if both uh, of those, these parameters are non zero, <clears throat> uh, and in particular, the model for all these, for genetic values, has no symmetries. So there is no conserved quantities. And if all, all parameters of the order one, uh, numerics shows that the model appears to be ergodic, and the spectral statistics, as I have showed you a few slides ago, is well described by random matrix theory. <clears throat> Okay, now, now I have to show you how to compute spectral form factor. So maybe the point of the next two slides is to show you that there is a way, there is a standard statistical mechanics uh, 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 procedure, a transfer matrix procedure to compute spectral form factor. And the key of that procedure is to basically be able to do disorder averaging 
uh, in the presence of some additional condition, which I'll try to discuss now. So, okay, so now let's just take this, uh, this model, the kick teasing model, I mean, uh, and try to uh, 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 first define precisely the object we want to calculate. So we want to calculate the ensemble average spectral form factor, where ensemble averaging is given in terms of uh, Gaussian averaging over IID values of longitudinal fields. So longitudinal fields are now assumed to be IID random Gaussian variables with mean h bar, h average, and standard deviation sigma. These are the two parameters in this game now, which we can play with at the end, but you know, this is uh, the additional parameters which characterize the averaging, right? <clears throat> So now, uh, again, I have to make immediately a disclaimer. I mean, none of the results I'm going to discuss actually depends on precise Gaussian form of the averaging. The averaging can be with respect to any distribution. What is important is that the random variables, the longitudinal fields should be independent uh, and perhaps identically distributed. I mean, probably this is not, even that is not crucial, but they have to be independent. Okay, so now what you have to do now is to compute this Gaussian integral, right? And K of T, we know how to compute it, just a trace of U to the T squared. Now, before embarking on that cal cal calculation, let me just show you some numerics. Uh, this is for 15 spins, so for a chain of 15 spins, so the Heisenberg time would be of the order of 2 to the 15. There is no conserved quantity, so the, one has to consider the full 2 to the 15 dimensional Hilbert space, so 2 to the 15 is somewhere far to the right. So basically what we see now here is uh, just a linear ramp with slope 2. And there are different curves which show different, I mean, these are, these are numerics. This is just the Monte Carlo sampling over uh, this, different disorder realizations with different strength of, of the uh, variance of, of, let's say, strength of disorder, right? Different colors refer to, to either small disorder or large disorder. Uh, it turns out that the results don't depend so much on the disorder strength, except that at very short times, uh, if you don't have large enough disorder, then the results start to fluctuate. It so turns out that this is actually just a finite size effect. So if you increase your system size, these fluctuations go down and in thermodynamic limit, there is no more fluctuations, even for very small disorder. So as you will see from analytical results later, I mean, this is uh, indeed so. And so, uh, but of course, I mean, this is just numerics from that we have not, we cannot yet conclude anything, but already here it's, it turns out that basically there is yeah, very little of tauless time, if not, uh, if at all, any tallest time effects. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, no. wouldn't you call this self-averaging if as you take sigma to zero, um, the curve still looks the same in the thermodynamic limit? Well, I mean, yeah, but I have to, I, I have to put sigma to zero at the end of a calculation, right? I see. Mm -hmm. I mean, I need a non non-zero sigma to do my calculation and then I can put it at the end as a very last limit, yeah? Uh-huh. Okay. The, point, the point is I have to use thermodynamic limit before sigma to zero limit. And otherwise, I can't do anything. Can't. So in the numerics, if you just pick a random single H, it, it doesn't, uh, it looks very different. Uh, you mean H or sigma? It, 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 in the numerics, if you pick a single disorder realization. Ah, OK. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, of course. It, single disorder realization just looks all over the place. Uh -huh, I see. I mean, from the very, uh, unless you do an averaging, right? I mean, but you have to, you can do averaging as, as I did before, you can do moving time averages and then it will again look like this. But this, this, this is, here we just used uh, 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 disorder averaging uh, just to, to first do numerics on the quantity, on the object that we will later on compute analytically, yeah? which is precisely disorder average spectral form factor. <clears throat> okay, so now, before showing, before showing you how to do that, let me just uh, right away uh, write down the result, which is, uh, I mean, I will not go through details of the proof, but you know, <clears throat> I mean, this is the result that I'm going to show or that we have been able to show, namely that in thermodynamic limit, the spectral average, the, the ensemble average spectral form factor is equal uh, to T for times long enough, larger than seven, for times lesser or equal to five, there is a small correction, which is all the one, which is two T minus one. So basically this is, uh, of course, you see, I mean, we have to do thermodynamic limits. So time, Heisenberg time is at infinity. So the random matrix result is just linear ramp, right? So infinite for all times. And there is essentially no tallest time effect if you want. So, I mean, if you want tallest time is five, okay, but uh, yeah, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's, it's all the one, tallest time is all the one. 
And uh, of course, you have to also uh, take note that uh, we can only do that for odd times. So for odd times, uh, the calculation can be redone. Uh, but for even times, uh, what we can do is we can compute a lower bound on spectral form factor, which is, uh, which is 2t plus 1. Or we can conjecture that the lower bound is tight, uh, which is argued uh, very strongly, but uh, we can't really prove it. So that all is, it turns out that actually even uh, for even at odd times, I mean, this, these models are mathematically very different. So, I mean, not so very different, but it is, they are different enough so that one has to use different, uh, essentially different, yeah, different, one has to engineer different calculation, computation for odd, even times. Anyway, <clears throat> so what I think this is just technicality. I'm not, go, I, I don't want to lose you on this technicality because it's really uh, inessential. Uh, so, at the end, I mean, what uh, I want to stress is that results are independent of sigma. So you see, I mean, there is no sigma in the statement of the result. The model is, which means that the model is ergodic for any disorder strand, which means that at that particular, and I forgot to stress that, I'm sorry for that, but I forgot to stress that for, for that result to apply, I have to use that the uh, value of coupling parameters J and B have to be equal to pi over four. So these are particular values, which I'm going to explain later, but you know, for that particular values, which we call self-dual, uh, that model, that results apply. And uh, for that, you know, this model is uh, ergodic for any value of disorder. So even for large disorder, there could be no cloquet MBL. Okay, and then of course we can take the limit uh, for the clean system at the end. We can, results are also independent of, of average value of the field, of the longitudinal field. So we can even take average value of the field to zero, which means we are expanding around the in integral system. But since, you know, we are never integrable, I mean, and we do, they, we do thermodynamic limit first before doing the limit to integrable system, then since these two limits don't commute, we get ergodic quantum chaotic dynamics all the way. Okay, so now a conclusion is that we found a simple local interactive model with finite dimensional local Hilbert space with proven RNT spectral statistics, at least for all times, at all times, <clears throat> at all, all times, if you want. And our question is, how do we show that? And what is the, basically, what is the, what is the statistical mechanical picture behind it? I mean, what is the uh, calculation that one has to, one has to do? <clears throat> so the idea now is uh, very simple. The idea is to understand a trace of the proper, I mean, basically, as you remember what we have to do, we have to compute the modulus square of the trace of u to the t, yeah? Now what I'm, denoting as UKI is the Floquet operator for the kick teasing model. It's precisely this, uh, this, this, this beast here. So it's a product of exponentials of two very simple Hamiltonians, uh, which it depends of course on formal parameters and uh, essential dependencies on longitudinal field, which I now write in terms of this uh, angular, angular bracket, square bracket dependence. <clears throat> okay, so now, uh, right, so the idea now is, okay, write this trace of u to the t as a partition function of a 2D statistical model. I mean, as you know, as you are used to, I mean, uh, quantum mechanics in one dimension is in some sense equivalent to statistical physics in two dimension when you treat the, the, the other time dimension as a second dimension. Uh, and to show that one simply inserts identity, you know, there is u to the t, so you can just insert t identities, which then you get t layers of time. So the horizontal axis now is time, vertical axis in space, is space. And uh, of course, each spatial point has different value of longitudinal field, which now, which I now indicate here with these red arrows. Okay, now computing this, this trace of u to the t now amounts to computing this partition function in terms of transfer matrix and uh, row transfer, the column transfer matrix, you just call the quantum propagator or the Floquet operator, right? So you're just applying the Floquet operator on a state from Hilbert space of the measures two to the L, right? And uh, once you're done, you do the trace. Uh, but you can do the question. Yep. So, so if if I just path integrated, uh, so it, just my definition of u, if I just done the integral from zero to n t, that would have been different than this u to the t. Is that right? Uh, and by n t, what do you mean? If if I just integrated the time dependent Hamiltonian up to to say from zero to n times the period, or, or I guess little t times the period. Okay, now you, okay, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I think it would be essentially the same. It's the same, yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, okay, of course, but... 
uh, I mean, you don't have to do continuous time. In, you, you, you don't have to do continuous path integral because the dynamics is essentially trivial uh, during the, the, the easing, you know, the easing dynamics is diagonal. So it keeps, I see. you expand with respect to computational basics, which, just, which is just the classical easing, uh, this, let's say eigenbasis of sigma z, which is the basis that you, you use in this calculation. So within this basis, I mean, the easing dynamics is trivial. It's just the diagonal, right? The propagator is diagonal. So if you use the, if you decompose, if you, if you insert identity, which is just the composite, I mean, the complete set of states in computational basis, then you get a path integral like expression, but it's a continuous, it's, 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 it's a discrete sum. It's not continuous path integral. Thank you. And that's, yeah, that's, that's what you want. So now, but the point I want to make now here is that you can, of course, uh, restate this this partition partition function partition sum as uh, I mean the co computation of this partition sum as a row transform matrix, which I denoted by this. Uh, 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 I mean, display this horizontal strip, right? And it so turns out, and of course I have no time to show you that in detail, but it is like a few line calculation. It turns out that the algebraic form of this row. Transform matrix is exactly the same as the column transform matrix. As, 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 as the column transform matrix actually has the same form as 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 as, as, as the Kirchhoffian Fokker operator, but with different coupling parameters. I call these coupling parameters now J tilde and B tilde, and there is a simple nonlinear nonlinear map between J and B and J tilde and B tilde. Right, and now of course the price you have to pay for this row transform matrix calculation is that this u tilde in general is not unitary because this j tilde and b tilde are complex numbers. These coupling parameters turn out to be complex in general, but there are special points in parameter space for which these coupling parameters, the dual coupling, what we call dual coupling parameters, j tilde and b tilde, actually are real numbers. And since if they are real numbers, which means that u tilde would be a unitary operator. Now this u tilde, by the way, is defined on a different Hilbert space. The Hilbert space now is dimension two to the t, right? And the dimension of Hilbert space is given by the number of time steps. So now you are basically doing dynamics in space on a spin chain of size, which is time. Yeah. And okay, so now question is under what conditions this guy is unitary? And it turns out that this is unitary exact, exactly when the absolute value of j and b is equal to pi over four. Okay, so this is the points which we call self-dual. So there are four points in parameter space for which this guy is exactly unitary. And that's super cool because this allows us now to do computation as you will see. Okay, so how do we do that? Now we basically, when we compute spectral form factor we have to introduce two copies, right? Because this is a second order, it's a two point object. It has trace of u to the t times trace of u to the t complex conjugate, which are now uh, plotting like uh, product of these two boxes. Where each of the boxes is now a partition function, right? But now it's kind of it's a product of two partition functions, and then I have to do the ensemble averaging, basically ensemble averaging over the disorder, which I de designate like this e here. But now the point is now if I do this row wise rather than column wise, I can use the fact that my disorder is an iid variable, which means that I can do this order averaging independently row by row, and that's really nice. Because it means I can do this order averaging explicitly by just introducing an averaged object, which I call transfer matrix. So local average. Now, now you see, I mean, this 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 row transfer matrix now depends on the field which is com which is homogeneous. It's the same at all points in time because this order is quenched. It's it's static, but uh, it depends on the space. So which means now u tilde has a homogeneous field, homogeneous longitudinal field, but it changes from point to point. And now what I define as T is just uh, this double product, double, I mean, it's a product of two transfer matrices, just tensor product, I have two copies. One is complex conjugate, but now average with respect to the Gaussian distributed field. And the whole thing, the whole ensemble average spectral form factor is just the, 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 the trace of this guy to power L, the number of rows I have here, right? So that's, that's the, the main thing. So, I mean, as soon as you understand that, that you are basically done, right? I mean, now you have, now, now why, why did I say that it's super cool that this guy is unitary? Well, I mean, you'll see immediately why, because if u tilde is unitary, then you can do something with this. Otherwise you are, again, uh, I mean, you don't know what to do, but if this guy is unitary, then basically this transfer matrix is a product of a unitary thing and something which is a pure contract, which is a contraction, which is a linear operator, which has a spectrum in a unit disk. 
Namely, I mean, I have not explained that yet, but and I, will, I will not have time because I want to move on. I guess I'm using whole lecture just for the first part. I'm sorry for that, but yeah, I wanted to be kind of clear on this. On this. So um, the point is, of course, I mean, if this U tilde is unitary uh, and the expect uh, and the uh, disorder averaging is, is, I mean, I assume it's Gaussian. If, if the disorder is Gaussian distributed, then this is just a Gaussian integral I have to do. And this Gaussian integral now results in this uh, Gaussian kernel, uh, right? And this MZ is just the component of the magnetization. So see now you have a transfer matrix, which is a product of a unitary and something which has a spectrum, which is inside unit disk. Now, if, the, if you wouldn't be at, if, if, you, if, if, if you wouldn't be at the, the self-dual points, then this guy would not be unitary, which means there would be eigenvalues beyond unit circle. And then you wouldn't know what to do. And actually then there would be tau less time effects because you know, then you couldn't do thermodynamic limit at all at fixed time. Because if you do thermodynamic limit at fixed time, you necessarily go beyond tau less time. Presumably tau less time depends on system size. So you always, for large enough system, you're always below tau less time. So, but in this model where this guy is unitary, actually uh, you basically, uh, uh, you, know, you can do thermodynamic limit at fixed time and still make sense. So what you have to have to do at, in thermodynamic limit, basically you just have to count how many eigenvalue one of this transfer matrix there is. So you have to count multiplicity of eigenvalue one of this uh, of this so constructed transfer matrix. Okay, and now right, and so that's that's the, now the the, the 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 point of the game is basically to to engineer uh, a, 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 a computational uh, a computational scheme in which you determine the number uh, the multiplicity of eigenvalue one of this transfer matrix. And so, moreover, I mean, you have to also prove that there is a gap to the rest of the spectrum, that there is a spectral gap. Uh, I give you just some, for a flavor, I just give you some, some, some numerics on the spectral gap. I mean, spectral gap actually opens uh, as soon as you introduce the solder averaging. So, and it opens a sigma square. So this is a spe spectral gap as a function of a uh, number of time steps. And this is a function of the, the other parameter of the averaging, the average field. I mean, the point is that spectral gap is always positive as soon as sigma is not zero. And this we can show. I mean, what we can show rigorously is that spectral gap is positive, but we cannot quantify it rigorously. So our result is in principle only valid in thermodynamic limit. And we can't really say anything about finite size corrections because knowing the spectral gap would, will allow us to give a precise finite size corrections. <clears throat> okay, now I'm about to close this part of the talk, but uh, let me just ask you before uh, I try to extrapolate the, the rest of the talk. I mean, when I'm supposed to finish? Um, so, well, officially you still have about 10 minutes, but um, it's you, you, you should feel free to go, you know, five minutes or... Okay, so I'll try to be more over time. slightly over 10 minutes, but not more. Okay, so now, right, so now, um, I will not go into any detail of this uh, of this statement here, but there is, uh, I mean, one thing which you know for those of you who have maybe some um, uh, affinity to concepts of uh, quantum information theory, I mean, this this transfer matrix actually is like a, a, a vectorized version of completely positive map. So you can show that you can do the unvectorization of the map. You can think of this as acting on appropriate density matrix. And uh, then basically you can uh, characterize all eigenvalue one of this map in terms of, um, in terms of a, a structure or if you want, in terms of a commutant of the algebra, which is spanned by four operators, the three generators of SU2 on a spin chain of T sides and an operator U, which is uh, a diagonal operator in computational basis and basically counts the parity of half number of domain walls of a spin configuration, of classical spin configuration, or, or, or diagonal spin, spin configuration of a, yeah, <laughs> of a state. So, uh, yeah. So this is, I don't know. I mean, I, I probably in, 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 in the interest of time, I cannot be more specific or explicit on that. But you know, uh, it's not difficult to show that the counting eigenvalues one simply amounts to showing uh, how many independent operators will satisfy these algebraic conditions you have. But that's that's it. So, and uh, I can immediately observe that I can construct two T operators which do the job. Namely, these are the, 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 the translations and reflections 
on a spin ring of these sides with periodic boundaries, that is on a polygon of, of t, t vertices. These are the symmetries of polygons of t vertices, which are basically elements of the dihedral group, which are t, t, which are t2 in number, two t in number. So this and you know if they are all independent, linearly independent, this gives us two t eigenvectors or eigen operators of this transfer transfer map, and this gives us the value of the spectral form factor, which is two t. The only thing to show now is that there is no other there is no other operators which simultaneously commute with these two guys. So that's a bit non-trivial to show that there are no others. Otherwise, we have a lower bound. And the other thing to show is that also these guys are all independent. Uh, as operators represented over spin chain of these sides. And this is only true for T large or equal to seven. That's why we had this two T minus five, minus one for T less than five, because for T less than five, it turns out that uh, one of these operators depends on the other. So there is a linear, linear relation <coughs> within this representation here. <clears throat> okay, uh, so I think I'm done here. Uh, so, I mean, uh, the rest is kind of very, tedious and technical uh, uh, algebra, so I'm not going to get into, but uh, as a bonus uh, exercise, I mean, uh, again, I have absolutely no time to go into details, but what we can do with very similar transfer matrix technology, which we, we can compute, for example, dynamics of entanglement entropy for, again, the same kick teasing chain, uh, it's self-dual points. And we can show that basically, if you look at entangled block entropy of, of a region of n spins, uh, in the thermodynamic limit, when the rest of the chain goes to infinity, then any Reni entropy of order or any order n can be again re, can be written can be can be actually computed to be a maximum that is it grows with the maximum rate. It turns out this is the maximum rate, then the entanglement entropy can grow, and then it saturates as soon as you reach basically the maximum entropy of the block, which is n times log two. <clears throat> and uh, well, there is a transfer matrix which is now a bit more complicated, depends on the Reni order as well. So it has three dimensions, now Reni order, time and space. And uh, you can compute the leading, I mean, you can basically compute just one eigenvector because there's just one eigenvalue one. And then you have to compute the structure of the leading eigenvector and show that this gives us the entanglement entropy. <clears throat> okay, the last point of my talk, which I'm going to go through now very briefly, but uh, is kind of synthesizing this uh, philosophy now into a definition of a new class of models uh, for which we can do something, namely, as you have seen from my transfer matrix computation of spectral form factor, the idea behind this uh, calculation is that the dynamics in space should be unitary. So the idea is, okay, let's now define dynamics in discrete space-time lattice. And the natural framework for that is the framework of, framework of quantum circuits. So let's now define quantum circuits as brickwork circuits with the two-body gate, which I will now paint as uh, this guy. Now time will go, I mean, I'm sorry for change of convention, but now time will go vertically. So now I and J are in states and K and L are out states. So now I suppose you have a unitary gate, a two-body gate, which is unitary of D square and D is the local Hilbert space dimension. So this gives us uh, uh, an image, I mean, uh, um, I, J are in states and K are out states. So this gives, gives us the, the amplitude. But now suppose that we are reshuffling the basis such that uh, we now consider I and K as in states and J and L and as out states. I mean, you can always do that. Of course, the point is that there is no reason why this mapping should be unitary, right? But now the question is under what conditions both mappings, the mapping in horizontal, uh, the vertical and the horizontal directions are, are both unitary. And mappings or unitary maps, uh, unitary matrices, which satisfies this double unitary condition we call dual unitary or the circuits which we build out of those, we call dual unitary circuits. So that is very simple. I mean, first of all, the definition of utility is simply this, this kind of index reshuffling and, uh, <clears throat> and the definition of uh, unitarity and dual unitarity. I mean, unitarity is clear, of course, and dual unitarity is just unitarity of the utility. So this gives us a constraint. I mean, this is this structure which of, 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 of unitaries, which satisfies these two conditions. Of course, there's not a group anymore. It's a more constrained uh, manifold. Uh, mm -hmm. To characterize this manifold for general local Hilbert space dimension is an open problem, but we can do this at least for qubits. And uh, now let's, uh, okay, I mean, probably I have to skip all those uh, very simple uh, diagrammatics, which I wanted to use to, to show you some result on that dual unitary circuits. But I, as I said, I mean, I'm going to skip that. 
uh, <clears throat> the idea is now to, uh, to just consider a piece of a brick walk circuit like that, right? Which has now four layers in time or two double layers and six double space layers. I mean, this is like a quantum circuit. Now we consider, suppose you want to compute spectral form factor of that, of that flow case system. Then you have to, again, use bound, periodic boundaries in space and time. And uh, then you could either consider this as a propagation in space or in time, and then propagation in space, uh, like uh, horizontally now. Uh, the question is, of course, under what conditions propagation space is unitary. And this is, of course, precisely when the, this gate is the dual unitary which is clear from the construction, right? And the uh, question is what you can do with that. Of course, I mean, you can compute again uh, traces now as a partition. I mean, this trace of this full circuit is, is a partition function, which you can now compute in two ways. Again, you have this duality formula. And furthermore, I mean, uh, I'm not doing this here, but we can also compute now spectral form factor for this general dual unitary circuits in a way which is very similar to the one for Kikti's model. Now, what I wanted to compute here for you, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that and just show you some result. Um, is dynamical correlation functions for general dual unitary circuits. And this is what we can do. Uh, and the reason why we can do that is basically, so here I'm just defining for you a general two point uh, space time correlation function or a tensor of correlation functions for arbitrary traceless operators, A alpha and A beta. So suppose you have D dimensional coherent space, you have D square minus one traceless operators, A alpha which are labeled by A alpha from different from zero and A zero will be reserved for identity. So you have this correlation function. This is a space and time correlation function. These are two points in space, X and Y have different points in space designated in this figure like this. And then there is a T layers in time. And this is U, W is a full propagator of a quantum circuit. And uh, uh, the statement I want to make without now going into any details of the proof is that that this correlation function is actually uh, non-zero only when the this displacement in space is equal to time. So that is when uh, it's only different from zero at along the light rays, which move with speed one or minus one, depending on the parity of the side I start from. And I will not now give you the technical proof of that, even though it would be com com very explicit in terms of the diagrammatics I didn't want to introduce at the end. But I will just give you an intuitive one sentence proof. I mean, why, why should this be so? Why should correlation functions only propagate uh, along right ways? Well, it is because you have double unitarity, right? I mean, unitarity implies uh, a causality, right? So even if you have unitarity and locality of interactions mean, means that cor quantum correlations can only spread within light cone, which is X lesser or equal to T. But since you have unitarity in space as well, double unitarity, this also applies that you have uh, correlations which can spread in the complement of the of the cone, which is t less or equal to x. And the intersection of the two causal cones is then just light rays, which are x is equal to uh, uh, absolute value of x is equal to absolute value of t, which is just two cones uh, as, you know, with speed plus minus one. I mean, there is this formal diagrammatic proof, which is very simple, but the point is, I'm, I'm skipping that, but the point is now the correlation functions along the light rays is not trivial. I mean, you, you might think, okay, this is like a free theory now, right? Or a swap uh, a circuit, right? Which where things can only spread. Uh, I mean, when correlations can only spread trivially, but they are not. I mean, it, it turns out that correlation functions on the light ray are actually given by a completely positive map. It's a completely positive trace preserving map, which is this one, which is depending again on the parity of the site you start from. You propagate on the left, on the right with a map, which we call N plus or N minus which in this diagrammatics is given in terms of this picture, but it's, in this, it's, it's, it's uh, representation is, is, is in terms of this partial trace, uh, right? And uh, this map, this is a unital trace preserving map. So technically speaking, it's a unital and trace preserving completely positive map. It has a spectrum which is inside unit disk, within unit disk. So it can, it can have spectrum which of eigenvalues which are smaller than one, which meaning that correlation functions can exponentially decay. So the correlation functions are written as, as correlation functions, as zero dimensional correlation functions of this, uh, let's say, single qubit or single qubit quantum channel. And now it depends on the spectrum of this quantum channel, whether these correlations could, would decay or would not decay, would oscillate and so on. I mean, everything is possible. 
Uh, for example, now you can have the full classification of dynamical behaviors of these correlation functions, now, namely in terms of the spectrum of these quantum channels and plus and minus, which I call lambda minus gamma and lambda plus gamma. You can basically provide explicit formula for the dynamics of correlation function. And depending on the spectrum, I mean, all these eigenvalues could be, at, could be at one. For example, this happens for the swap circuit, which is also double unitary. Then you have non -inter this is really like a caricature of non-interacting dynamics, right? Now, we, when some eigenvalues are in the inside unit disk, but still some eigenvalues are at one, these dynamics would be non-ergodic because there would be modes which won't decay along the light rays. But then you can have uh, some eigenvalues which are on unit circle, but different from one, meaning that there would be modes which wouldn't decay, but would oscill they would oscillate, which would perhaps by some people be called time crystals. And then uh, in generic case where all non-trivial eigenvalues, I'm saying non-trivial because there is always a trivial eigenvalue which corresponds to a unit operator, where all non-trivial eigenvalues are in unit circle, then you would have, you would have what you would call in the terminology of dynamic, uh, dynamic consistency theory, ergodic and mixing dynamics. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, I think I'm going to close now. So uh, as I said already before in passing, uh, there is a classification of all dual unitaries for qubits. A more example of those is uh, integrable gates, which are XXZ gates or swap gates uh, or maximally chaotic like self dual key teasing models, but there, there's much more. Okay, so now I think I'll have to go straight to the, to the conclusion. So there is of course much more we can do. And I just had one slide, for example, on operator entanglement, uh, which we can also do almost explicitly for this type of models, which is perhaps more interesting than state entanglement in this case, because it's an honest, uh, more honest characterization of complexity of, 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 of operator spreading. But uh, I'm, I'm happy to discuss this in the discussion part of, of our meeting. So I'm going straight to the conclusions. Uh, so before I forget, I mean, I've shown you some rather specific results uh, on connecting dynamics of many body spin systems, many body spin chains to random matrix theory uh, or quantum chaos. But the natural question is of course, if these results are stable against perturbations and there has been a, a, a preprint posted a few months ago by our group uh, with some preliminary results suggesting affirmative, uh, affirmative answer to this question. As I, as I say, I mean, there are some preliminary results so we can identify some classes of circuits which are stable, but the most general circuits, of course, are still beyond reach of uh, rigorous analysis, but we can make some conjectures based on some numerics. So it's, I think, quite promising. The second line of research, which I think is very promising, is uh, try to, to try to approach ergodicity breaking transitions from an ergodic site. Uh, there is some debate about, uh, I'm also responsible for some, for some recent debates on uh, on on, on, on uh, <clears throat> many body localization, uh, on ultimate fate of many body localization thermodynamic limit uh, through studies of spectral form factor. So these transfer matrix methods offer us some, maybe some analytical tool to address maybe our transitions from the ergodic side. And the third threat of research, which I would still, I would also like to pursue in future, which I think is quite promising, but very hard, at least with the methods I've Disclose to, you, disclose to you this uh, this talk. It's still impossible to say anything, but I think still the, the general flavor of the ideas could be maybe expanded to treat, uh, uh, let's say, uh, problems of eigenstate thermalization in chaotic dual unitary systems. But I, I, I stress ETH is hard and I don't see how, possible, how, how it would be possible at the moment because of one simple reason, namely to prove ETH or to, 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 to say anything about ETH, one has to be able to control time to infinity limit before doing thermodynamic limit. I mean, there you have to prove results about the matrix elements for or, or, or eigenvectors of, uh, of, of many body systems, which are many body but finite because otherwise the spectrum uh, matrix elements would not exist, would not make sense. And then you would make, you, you would want to make proof statements. You would want, you want to put st proof statements about how this scaling by increasing system size. But of course, after you took that time to infinity limit. So as we know very well, that time to infinity and size to infinity or thermodynamic limit don't commute. I mean, this is a completely different set of questions, which, mean, which means we have to control finite systems, 
you know, dual unitary circuits with boundary conditions. What happens due to that is not clear at the moment, but uh, I think it's interesting uh, to investigate that in future. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm sorry for being a bit, for being a bit late. All right, thanks. Well, let's uh, thank Tomas for the very nice talk. Um, and maybe we'll take uh, one question before going on to the discussion. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, please. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is it possible to have a <clears throat> hydrodynamic transport in these uh, geodynamic dynamics? Uh, to add what hydrodynamic? Yeah, say diffusive type of transport. It seems the answer is no, right? Because uh, you have okay, this so The question is if it's possible to add conserved quantities, right? Conserve right. conservation loss. That's that's yes. the question. Conservation loss, and then what happens to this conservation loss in real time? Okay, I think okay. The answer is yes, but uh, so far, I mean, we have actually we have actually done a paper uh, this year, early this year. Uh, published in SciPost. We have a pair of paper in SciPost. One is on dual unitary circuits with conservation laws. Uh, the problem is that these conservation laws are rather trivial. I mean, they are not very interesting from point of view of transport. We call these conservation laws quantum solitons. Um, but I, I mean, I, I mean, I think we have to we have to go to local Hilbert space dimension, which is larger than two, and then we can. Uh, I think we can generalize also uh, the. Con I mean, we can treat circuits with conservation laws within dual unitary systems. I'm not sure, again, that this would be non-trivial because of that feature that dual unitarity implies spreading correlations along right rays. So that right. might still be uh, a drawback. Uh, yeah, presumably one would, I mean, if I want genuine transport, I would expect some diffusive scaling. Right, but you see, I mean, they still have you can still have the k of correlations, which means that you can still have finite transport coefficient. It's just that see, your structure factor would not look very, very typical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm, I mean, I don't, I don't know really. I mean, the, the best answer is I don't know. But uh, I mean, I still think it's not excluded that we can treat diffusive transport within this class of models. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's as much as I can say at the moment.